Josh and Sid are brothers who live in rural California. They play out on the street during the day and move their makeshift hockey goalposts when familiar neighborhood cars roll past. Well, because, you know, they, they play hockey and sometimes cars come by and so they got to move the goalposts. That's the way it works. Their parents fight sometimes, but not too much. It's a happy bubble of a small family. Josh is the oldest brother. He's already strong-headed and getting into trouble at school. His antics are putting a strain on the family. And his parents are beginning to whisper about medication. <laughs> Special schooling. Violent video games. Sid is the youngest brother. And he looks up to his brother. Josh, more than anyone else in the world. Sid likes dogs, but isn't allowed one because his mother is allergic to them. He wants to be an accountant, like his father, but doesn't know what that even hot damn means. One late night, Josh is still awake. Something is bothering him. He can't quite place what it is. The hallway light, it's on still. Josh goes out into the hall of the family home he's grown up in. He discovers his parents, but they aren't his parents. They are pressed to the TV screen in the games room. That's right, the TV screen in the games room. Locked into a private ritual with, with the blazing pool of pulsating static on the screen of the TV. Josh, he tries to get their attention, then tries to pull them away, then can't stop crying. <laughs> Josh rushes to make sure his brother is still there, and he is. Sid is asleep in his bed. Several weeks pass, and the brothers live out their lives as an odd ritual to the altar of their hypnagogic parents. The parents' skin is darkened, and, and the one time Josh pulled out the power cable from the TV, they grabbed him, and he quickly put it back. He would have bruises for a long time after that, where his father clamped his hand around his wrist, and where his mother locked onto his ankle. The brothers fed themselves the best they could and saw the children caring for their own parents alone in their small part of suburbia. The other kids were strangers now. School friends looked right through them. The brothers were eating a lot of candy and felt sick all the time. TV would flicker and images soaring spectacular, a bizarre montage of hedonistic, blood-soaked bodies, steel talons, and that constant roar of static. <laughs> so loud the brothers put pillows over their heads and against their doors so I could sleep. The brothers, Josh and Sid, were lost in their own house. Sid, the younger brother. Uh, I heard static change on the TV one night. It went from... It was different. Josh had most of the pillows piled up on top of him to block out the noise and didn't hear. But Sid did. Sid walked out and he saw it for the first time. A monster. A huge... Steel Corral. Ha ha! 
so ancient and gruesome, young Sid didn't have words to describe it to his brother later. The monster enveloped their small home. It pressed against their house and was staring in at them. The monster exploded through, impaling and picking up Sid's parents in front of him in a, a flash of black and crimson steel. His parents were gone and there was a hole in the roof. brothers didn't know what to do. They were running low on food and their parents had been taken by a monster. Crow, they called him. Crow. There was nothing to stay for. Sid said, we have to go after Crow. We have to get our parents back. Josh agreed. He thought his younger brother was acting more like him, more impulsively. Josh also thought it would be easier for him out there where the monsters were real and not in his head. Oh, it gets crazier. Trust me. The brothers needed a way to move unseen in the world of the monsters. They had seen other children be taken, seen other monsters on the TV. They needed to look like they belonged in the land of monsters. And so they made themselves into monsters with felt, tape, staples, old Halloween costumes, bed sheets, using their mother's sewing machine. They created their own monsters. Josh was a red monster. Josh wanted to drive, but their father had the car keys in his pocket when he was taken. As the brothers leave their home, the kids in the other houses looked out at the brothers leaving. There were less kids in the windows every day, less and less. The ones that were present that day saw two monsters leaving a house with a destroyed roof. Hmm, yeah. Some of the watching children were curious that they didn't see the monsters enter, only leave. Some were, hmm, too hungry to care. Brothers travel through the streets of the neighborhood. Sid is pulling an overloaded red wagon. Yeah, red wagon. Filled with toys, VHS tapes, some of the last remaining food they had, and also a baseball and a perspex box. Yeah, perspex box. Sid's father always told him it was very special and that he couldn't play with it.
It took almost an entire day to reach the town they lived next to. The brothers were tempted to try and get a car from another house, but every time they approached, the children inside screamed and the brothers rushed away. They needed a car and some supplies if they were going to make it to their parents in L.A. The town felt bigger than they remembered. Each building seemed to look at them. It was quiet with more people, like your parents, more grown-ups, standing, staring, searching out signals, gray skin, black eyes, skeletal monsters, <laughs> seeing nothing. The brothers could tell they were entering monster town. The brothers found what they were looking for, supplies. They spent the night in a tent in a shop at the mall. They were on an adventure. But they felt very, 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 very small. The noises of the town were sudden, violent, and then scary. But with the tent closed up, it was just them. A and they watched a video that, that they brought with them on a portable TV, and the noises in the night sounded distant. Then the brothers slept. There is a noise that Sid recognizes. It's the sound that the TV made when Crow came for his parents. It is terrifying. The camping TV flickers and burbles up an image of the town from way up in the air. The boys start to hear shuffling noises around them. The TV has attracted them. The gray skeleton figures clumsily shuffles through the tents, searching out the sweet signal. The brothers move quietly, crawling out of the tent, dragging their cart, but leaving the TV as a distraction. They can hear the mass of gray fingers muffling the TV with their bodies as they coldly embrace it. The sound of the static can still be heard in the town as every TV and speaker is vibrating with crows. We need to get another TV says Josh. It can show us when Crow is nearby. We can see. We can see the distortion on the screen when it comes nearby and use it to track Crow down, said Josh. brothers make it to the car in the showroom. It's like a fantasy of picking whatever car you want for free and driving it away, but it doesn't feel like a fantasy. It feels more like a nightmare. They pick a car and that need to drag in some boxes. We don't even understand what that's all about. So Josh can reach the pedals. Now we understand that the brothers drive off. Crow is flying back to L.A. and the brothers follow it for a while until it disappears over the horizon. All the monsters in the town didn't pay any attention to the two monsters driving the car. The city is starting to burn. As the brothers hit the highway, they can see it but they don't mention it to each other. They both don't know what to say to make the other feel better. Sid marks the map with crayon, showing the distance traveled so far and how far they have left to go.
their car ride phase from escape to freedom. They were trapped inside for so long they feel free. They listen to music on the stereo and talk about how they're going to kill a crow. They laugh for the first time in a while, playing music and putting their heads outside the car's windows and, and, and they enjoy the way the sun feels on their skin. Brothers arrive in the shadow of the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> the streets are, are flooded with more TV dead skeletons, and as the brothers approach, they're forced to abandon the car and move across overturned cars in the street. Like they are playing, the floor is lava. Remember that game? The city is so big, and the brothers came from such a small. Brothers are stuck. A trail of cars has run out, and they are contemplating spending the night on the roof of an abandoned bus when a girl in a bucket hat shouts down to them. <laughs> That's right. She has a bow on her back, and then she guides them to her, creating a gap in the ward, and then occasionally shooting an arrow if one of the TV dead gets too close to the brothers. She drops a rope ladder, and the boys climb up to her. The brothers thank her, and Josh doesn't think he has ever seen a girl prettier than her. <laughs> oh, she rescued them, but doesn't want to help them any further. But she can see the brothers are hopeless and, 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 and naive. She decides that she will take them some of the way and keep them safe. They don't talk. When they stop to eat, the girl is happy to get some of their food, leftovers from the camping store. They begin to tell each other stories, not all of them, but the girl learns of their journey to save their parents. The girl tells them about how the city has changed. She tells them that monsters rule LA, and she is there to kill Crow, and they should travel together for safety. As the brothers move from building to building, sleeping on rooftops under smoggy stars of LA, inside office buildings, scavenging food and drinks from vending machines, time passes. Josh liked spending time with the girl and Sid felt a sense of family in those dark days. There were other monsters in the city, other kids, some had guns. Sometimes the brothers could see lights in the distant buildings at night. And the girl would tell them about the clans of the monsters in the city, of the violence, the chaos that came from all this and how dangerous things were. She helps keep the brothers safe, and they know it. Yes, they know it. The brothers and the girl lose track of time. They begin exploring. They meet friendly monsters in, in family restaurants, playing arcade games, eating endless amounts of junk food. And they saw other monsters with big chunky handguns and bandoliers of ammunition. They stayed clear of them. The girl could always spot them coming and the brothers and the girl would become very small and hide under desks and in between walls and, and wait for the loud monsters to pass by. 
one day, the girl was not so lucky. And she didn't hear them. Sid didn't hear them. And the monsters found them. With an ambush, he had been tracked for some time. There was a legion of monsters cackling with big guns. They got Sid. They had a gun to Sid's head. The gun looked very big. Sid was sobbing. The girl drew an arrow. The monsters all thought that this was funny. They were wearing a variety of monster disguises. It was hard to tell where the disguise ended. And the children began. Let him go, said Josh. We've been following you, said the monster with a big handgun to Sid's head. What monsters are you? said the monster with a big handgun. We're not with anyone. His voice was voice steady. Now let my brother go, said Josh. What are you doing in Monster City? Don't you know it's dangerous? Said the monster with a gun in a cruel and unfunny way. We've come to rescue our parents. Crow took them. It sounded hollow coming out of Josh's mouth. Josh didn't really know what he was doing in L.A. anymore. The monsters surrounding them hooted and chuckled at Josh's reply. Your parents are dead. Crow took them. They don't come back. No one does, said the monster with a big handgun. Just let us go on our way. We're peaceful. We can trade, said the girl. What do you have to trade for your brother? said the monster with the big handgun. We have VHS tapes, says the girl. What movies do you have? Asks an impolite onlooker who has remained silent up until now, like an AR-15 rifle. We have the final episode of Huchio, the girl said. No way, says the monster with the AR-15. I recorded it off TV. It's good. I even cut out all the ads, Josh says. Josh slowly takes off his backpack and puts his hand in and pulls out a tape. The monster with the AR looks hungrily at the tape. They exchange the tape for Sid slowly and in silence. Then... As they are handing the tape over, the monster with the gun looks up at the taller, older Josh. How old are you? He asks. Fifty, Josh says. When is your birthday? Says the monster. Why? Asks Josh. That's when you're going to hear this signal. That's when everyone hears the signal. When they're sixteen, that's when you die. The small boy with the gun in the monster costume smiles. And the monsters with guns dissolve back into the building. The brothers and the girl are alone again, but they can still hear the sounds of the excited monsters urgently bringing the VHS tape to the closest VCR. They travel in silence for what feels like a long time. That night, Sid sleeps curled up. Josh and the girl take watch. The girl tells her story to Josh. All of this time, she hasn't told anyone else. She was at the movies with her parents the day the signal turned on. Her little sister was with her when the signal came through on the big screen and speakers changed to the thick static hum of the signal. All the grown-ups surged towards the screen. They trampled her little sister like she wasn't even there to them. She wasn't quite dead, but she died quickly. I stayed with her. I called out for help, but they could only hear the signal. 
After that, it was bad. The girl didn't know what to do with herself. Eventually, some people found her. Monsters in the city, like the ones that just threatened to kill Sid. They took her in because she was scary, violent, lost, and could use a bow, which was quieter for killing other monsters. But it turned bad. The leader hit 16, or around there, and died. Yeah, that's right, died. The monster clan imploded. It turned real bloody. Again, she watched for a second time as people she cared for died. It wasn't long after that when she found the two brothers, innocent and stranded on a car roof. <laughs> She tells Josh that they're all going to die soon enough, either by monsters or when they age out. Sixteen can. Josh tells her that he is already sixteen, just forgot about it. They briefly kiss. The moon is very large. Josh and the girl decided on that night they will do everything in their power to kill Crow, to stop the signal. That night felt special to both of them. It takes several days for the brothers and the girl to reach where the signal was coming from. The brothers used their portable TV with an antenna attached to track the crow and follow it back to a tower, a big tower. It's obvious from a long way away that this is where the signal comes from. There's lots of TV dead in the street, packed up against each other. They make no noise, and apart from wind and the creaking of satellite dishes and sound of wind through cables, it's very, very quiet. The brothers and the girl jump from rooftop to rooftop, climbing down onto cars when they have to cross the streets to the tower. signal is getting louder and louder, but only for Josh. He can see it in his head now like a burning static sky at the back of his eyes. The portable TV starts to flicker and Crow is nearby. He is hungry. Josh knows that Crow can see him now. Josh knows that Crow wants him now in a primal elemental hunger that Josh is only now able to comprehend <laughs> as Crow descends. They rush into the tower. Crow attacks! The silent TV dead hordes are now screaming. The signal is so loud it's deafening. White line inside their heads. Josh desperately climbs the stairs, chasing after the others as he stumbles from the pain inside of his head. Crow stabs through the concrete and glass of the building, blindly scarring the structure in rage. Crow won't stop. It's hungry for Josh. It knows him. Josh breaks away from Sid and the girl. Josh looks at his brother and he, and he looks betrayed. <laughs> the girl knows what Josh is going to do. And only looks, nods. Josh turns, runs, pulling Crow away. Sid tries to go after his brother to save him. But the girl stops him and starts dragging him up the stairs. They can't hear as Crow tears into Josh with its razor talons slicing through him. Disemboweling him. They're too far away to hear Josh cry out for the last time. Sid and the girl go past anonymous floors full of desks with cables and smashed computers. No one has been in here. The monsters were always afraid to go in, and it feels like a mummified goes down. Quiet.
The cables that had been dormant, filling the rooms, are hungry. They start to reach out and snare the girl. That's right. One grabs her arm and leg. She kicked it off. Another lashes her wrists, but she managed to cut loose with an arrow. And then more find her, and more! Far too many! And she is underneath a mass of seething black plastic. The Sid cries out, but it happens too fast. Dreamlike, he continues through the labyrinthine tower. He, he finds his way through to the top floor. He feels separated from the world, uh, floating somewhere private. It's quiet up here. As he walks through the TV office at the top of the tower, he removes his monster head. <laughs> the office looks quite normal apart from a huge row of machinery on one side of the room and a button with a piece of paper next to it saying, Play me, written in red sharpie. <laughs> Sid presses play and after some static and tracking, the tape begins to play. thousand years ago, at the bottom of the ocean, there were subnautical sea creatures. They were colossal, bigger than cities. They had huge brains that worked differently than we do now, and their brains were strong enough to shape the world they lived in. Eventually, these ancient oceans became deserts, but below Los Angeles, California, there were a few of these creatures still left stuck in perpetual stasis, dreaming. The original settlers came to this place because of them, because of the power of the creatures' dreams. Eventually, an industry will be set up to broadcast their dreams across the world. But as every image was broadcast, more and more was taken from the sleeping colossi, going even deeper into their sleeping brains. <laughs> Long cables were injected. Dark passages and caverns started to emerge in the creature's brain. Eventually, we took too much. Their minds began to cave in on themselves. They went from dreaming the most beautiful dreams to the darkest nightmares twisting the world above them into their dark subterranean fantasies. If you're hearing this, it's over. The signal has already gone out. The world is their nightmare now. We're trying to kill them in the end, but mm, mm, we couldn't. The TV office has a direct link to the Colossi brain. If you have the sword, now's the time to kill the monster. Sid sees where they pull the VHS tapes from, where the voice on the tape told him to go. Sid moves towards the machine and then stops. He puts his hand under his monster costume and pulls out a VHS tape. He puts it into the slot and presses it down. The mechanism picks it up and pulls it in. You can hear the disparity sounds of the tape patch being opened and the black vinyl thing spooled out. Warm images begin to play on the CRT screens around him. Warm colors and laughter. Children's faces float in and out of focus. Wood tiled floors. Laughter, happiness. Sid and Josh, younger, <laughs> holding a hummingbird on their finger. Deep down, where the cables enter the sleeping monster's head and connect to the tower in the city. Far, far above, the images reach back. The creatures feel the images. Its nightmare begins to slow. It quiets down 
below the earth's surface, there is a soft, radiant light of innocence and joy. The restless colossi slides back into a deep, tranquil sleep that it's not experienced in a long, long time. The signal flickers and shimmers and stops. The creature is now tranquil. The girl, many floors below, is released from the cables that were choking her to death. She sees the skies out of the window and can tell the world is different again. Crow disintegrates in the sky, becoming just pieces of metal, blood, bone, plastic, as it falls, showering the city streets with its carcass. The girl and Sid stand on the rooftop of the tower, the highest building in LA. They look out at the city. They've just woken from a nightmare, says the girl. Sid is still looking out over the many thousands of blocks, over the mountains and deserts and oceans. I'm going to miss my brother a lot. I'm going to think of him every time I wake up. The girl says, I will too. Sid says, I like being LA monsters with you, even the bad parts, but it's time to become something else, something 